Were the winters really colder when grandfather was a boy than they are now? Does industrial activity have any influence on climate? What makes wool shrink when it gets wet? Can there be any falling stars? These are among the questions we'll be answering as we present transcribed Excursions in Science. Your science reporter, Howard Tupper, has been discussing climate with Dr. Gilbert N. Plass, assistant professor of physics at the Johns Hopkins University. Tupper, is the climate in this country really changing? Yes, and not only in this country, Bill. Dr. Plass told me that there are many lines of evidence which show that the climate has slowly been warming up during the 20th century over almost the entire Earth's surface. What is this evidence? Well, some of it comes from the temperature readings that have been taken at stations around the world during the last century. With only a few exceptions, they show that the average temperature started upward around 1890 and has continued rising since then. So science agrees with Grandpa when he says the winters were more severe when he was a boy. Yes, and the glaciers will corroborate Grandpa, too. Dr. Plass says that, with only a few exceptions, all known glaciers from Alaska to New Zealand have decreased in size during the last half century. The gradual northward migration of plants and animals in recent years provides further evidence. In fact, crops are now being raised in northern parts of Canada where they could not have grown 50 years ago. Codfish have moved from the Atlantic waters near New England to the waters up near Greenland, where they were not found 50 years ago. And many mammals and birds are reported in northerly ranges that they did not formerly inhabit. How many degrees on the thermometer does this temperature increase represent, Tom? The average rate of temperature rise over the entire Earth's surface is about 2 degrees Fahrenheit per century. This may seem like a very small temperature variation, but we must remember, Bill, that such a small change in the average temperature can cause a very large change in the climate. How so, Tom? Well, the meteorologists estimate that if the average temperature for the whole Earth should drop by only 4 degrees, glaciers would again advance from the poles and perhaps cover most of Canada and the northern United States. Dr. Plass mentioned that some meteorologists believe that the trend toward a warmer climate may have been reversed in the last 10 years. Ten years? Isn't that a mighty short period for such observations? Yes, Dr. Plass says it is probably too short to tell whether it represents a real trend or merely a minor fluctuation. In fact, even the last half century is an exceedingly short time interval compared to the several billion years that are recorded in the geologic history of the Earth. Well, if the climate has changed noticeably in 50 years, how different was the climate millions of years ago? Fortunately, the geologic record can provide a good answer to this question, going as far back as the last 500 million years. For about 90% of this time, the climate has been much warmer than at present, with tropical conditions existing over most of the Earth's surface. However, at intervals of about 250 million years, there have been relatively short periods, lasting for several million years, of intense cold, with glaciers covering a large portion of the Earth's land surface. Such a glacial period has been in progress for the last million years. Only 10 to 20,000 years ago, ice sheets were covering large parts of North America and Europe. What has caused all these variations in the Earth's climate, Tom? Many different theories have been proposed, Bill. A decrease in the energy output of the sun, or changes of the direction of the Earth's axis and of the Earth's orbit around the sun, or an increase in the average height of the land, or an increase in the volcanic dust in the atmosphere. All these things would act to lower the temperature at the surface of the Earth. Dr. Plass says that several objections can be raised to each of these theories, which shows that none of these factors acting alone can explain all the climate of the past. On the other hand, it is likely that each of these factors has had at least a small influence on the climate at certain definite periods in the Earth's history. Isn't there an explanation of some kind that's pretty generally accepted? There are many factors to consider, Bill, and agreement is still far off. Dr. Plass demonstrated that when he gave me the details on the carbon dioxide theory of glaciation that was proposed by John Tyndall about a century ago to explain weather changes. What is that theory, Tom? Well, the action of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has often been compared to a greenhouse. The glass in a greenhouse is transparent to the visible light that comes directly from the sun. However, the heat that is radiated by the plants and other objects in the greenhouse has a very much longer wavelength than visible light. Glass happens to be largely opaque to these wavelengths, and that keeps the heat energy trapped in the greenhouse. The result is that the greenhouse is warmer than the outside air. 
Carbon dioxide acts for the atmosphere near the Earth's surface just as the glass does for the greenhouse. Carbon dioxide is transparent to the direct solar rays, but absorbs a fairly large proportion of the returning long wavelength heat radiation from the Earth. Does that mean that if the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere were increased, the carbon dioxide would prevent a larger proportion of the long wavelength radiation from escaping to space? Exactly, Bill. The greenhouse would have been made more effective and the surface temperature of the Earth would have had to rise. For example, the latest calculations show that the surface temperature would rise 7 degrees for clear sky conditions if the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere should be doubled. On the other hand, if the amount of carbon dioxide should decrease, more heat radiation could escape to space and the surface temperature of the Earth would go down. How much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere now, Tub? Only three hundredths of one percent is carbon dioxide, Bill, but it is so effective in controlling the outgoing heat radiation that it has this large influence. Other atmospheric components, such as water vapor, do not materially interfere with the effect of the carbon dioxide because of their entirely different distribution with height. Is there any way that scientists can pin down this carbon dioxide theory? Yes, they have investigated the different factors that contribute to the carbon dioxide balance in our atmosphere. Plants use up about a million, million tons of carbon dioxide per year in photosynthesis. This must be balanced by the carbon dioxide released by respiration of plants and animals and by the decay of all types of organic material. Is carbon dioxide used up or given out by non-living things, too? Yes, there are also important contributions to the carbon dioxide balance from the inorganic world. The weathering of rocks, for example, changes them from silicates to carbonates and withdraws 100 million tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere each year. About the same amount of carbon dioxide is added to the atmosphere each year from the interior of the Earth. It comes to the surface mainly through hot springs and to a smaller extent from volcanoes. Do man's puny efforts make any significant change in the carbon dioxide balance? Very significant. The burning of coal, oil, and wood in industrial processes and other human activity is releasing 6,000 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year. Dr. Plass says that after balancing out the contribution from the organic world, this man-made contribution is larger than any of the natural contributions. If all this extra carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere and no other conditions change, Man is actually causing the average temperature to rise two degrees per century. And man will probably add more and more as the years go on, I suppose. Yes, Dr. Plass believes that any reasonable projection of our industrial activity indicates that it will continue to increase for many years. Direct measurement of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere tends to show that the carbon dioxide content has gone up 10% during the last half century. This is exactly the amount that has been added to the atmosphere by industrial activity during this period. The average temperature rise observed for the last 60 years also agrees nicely with the temperature rise calculated from the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Doesn't that pretty well prove the validity of the carbon dioxide theory of glaciation? Well, Bill, the evidence certainly suggests that man himself is now influencing his climate to an important degree through the carbon dioxide that his activities are adding to the air. But Dr. Plass says a word of caution is appropriate here. The number of different factors controlling the climate is so large, and they are all related in such complex ways, that it seems very unlikely that a single factor can be the explanation of all the climatic changes of the past. Undoubtedly, many different factors have been important at different times. However, it seems clear that the variation of carbon dioxide is one of the important factors that must be considered in theories of climatic change. Thank you, Tom, for this account of your talk with Dr. Plass of the Johns Hopkins University. Any listener desiring more information about the effect of industrial activity on our climate needs only write to Excursions in Science in care of this station asking for a copy of Science Paper Number 646. That's Science Paper Number 646. And if you have any questions or problems of a science...